Test, test, test. All right, look at that, a, sli <clears throat> a slide. So I haven't quite lost my voice yet, but I'm really close, so this should be exciting for all of us. Welcome to JavaScript for Rails developers, uh, which is not a pejorative, it's not an insult. It's for JavaScript for people who want to get stuff done. My name is Zach Briggs, the other Zach in Twitter. Uh, I think it's great that Twitter has provided a way for me to quantify my self-worth through followers. So I encourage you to increase that. Uh, I'm the JavaScript practice lead at TableXI. Uh, we're a small consultancy, around 30 people, uh, and we are allergic to wasting client money. We like taking projects and shipping them. Uh, I have spoke or taught workshops around the world. I love getting up in front of people and talking. And I've shipped systems in Ruby, JavaScript, and Clojure. And I've been building single page apps or JavaScript heavy web, web apps since 2012. So if there's a way to screw this stuff up, I guarantee you I've done it. Today, this talk has two parts my rules for surviving JavaScript, and a concrete example of the rules with no hidden code. So let's get right to the rules, shall we? HTTP is pretty simple. The user clicks a link or submits a form, goes to the server, server returns a page. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between user actions and page loads. The moment we add front-end JavaScript, and from here on out, when I say JavaScript, I mean front-end JavaScript, um, the moment we add that to a web app, we've added complexity in moving parts. I, no matter how good the framework is, uh, no matter how good your code is, a JavaScript-heavy page is just going to be more complex than a server-rendered page. So therefore, rule one, if you can avoid JavaScript, avoid JavaScript, avoid JavaScript. just don't use it, right? If, if, if you can model your UI so one user action results in a, a single, uh, results in a full page load, just do that. A UI widget, jQuery plugin, uh, they solve problems, but they do it in a black box manner. You get a you get a um, uh, an appliance, right? You'll get a modal appliance or a sortable grid appliance uh, with no flexibility. So therefore, a widget that solves 90% of your problems is worthless because they're not extensible. Data tables, for example, is a sortable grid widget. Uh, it allows you to type and filter your list. Does it keystroke by keystroke by keystroke? However, if that filter operation is expensive, say a very expensive server-side uh, uh, search, then you might get into trouble because it's really, really hard to allow a user to type an entire word and hit enter or click go because you're not composing your own UI. You're using that black box abstraction. Widgets also hijack your markup. When Bootstrap first came out, it took a while for those widget libraries, once again, when I say widget, think jQuery plugin, uh, to update to allow uh, Bootstrap, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Like, those two shouldn't have anything to do with each other, whether or not you're using a CSS framework and the widget library. However, since they do take control of your markup, which is the price we pay for solving a complete problem, um, you might not be able to use the CSS framework of your choice with certain widgets. Also, widgets are big. Uh, select two chosen data tables. They're all 20 to 80K, which is larger than a lot of uh, JavaScript frameworks. So if you have a few of those on the page at once, your payload size might be too big. Therefore, 
Rule two, use widgets, but only when they solve your problem completely. Simple things should be easy, right? This is a quick example from a website we built at TableXI for the Spice House, and it's just a search, right? The desi our designer, Rex, came up with this, and we wanted to build it, and we should be able to build stuff like this in less than a day, and we did. And, and it just makes a request to the server, brings that back, and uh, throws it in that dropdown. We're not using a UI widget in this case because, it, because something like select2 didn't quite fit. But we should be able to have that flexibility, right? We should be able to make novel UIs, right? UIs that don't fit in a predetermined box. Hard things should be possible. This is the Spice House. This is the Spice House's checkout flow. Their old site had five or six full page refreshes through the checkout process. It was built a few years ago. It's pretty common. Their new checkout process is a single page. There's up to 11 different Ajax requests in here. It took me three months to build this because I'm dealing with money. Right? And I just went over budget. We, we changed things a few times. It's, it's, a, complex, it's a complex web page. So every change was really expensive. However, when we shipped it, their cart abandonment rate dropped by 22%. I mean, it was a stark difference. So when we have a reason to do, to do a hard thing, that should be possible. Therefore, rule three, adopt an automatic view library and include it in your projects by default because those simple things should be possible Excuse me, the simple things should be easy and the hard things should be possible. So what the hell is an automatic view library, right? I made this word up because we don't, what I have in my head is we don't have a word for it, which is kind of weird, right? We should be able, like a word for a thing you use to compose a dynamic user interface. Like we, we have frameworks and reactive components, but they don't quite fit. This is a little bit more general. So here's what I have in mind. The output of an automatic view library is a tree of DOM nodes. The input is user actions and data. So as the data changes or as the user takes actions, the UI should be able to update without you having to worry about the details. You should never have to write inner HTML, right? An automatic view library must be able to handle loops, must be able to render a collection. An automatic view library must be able to render conditionally, if statements and loops, right? It also must provide a means of abstraction. Currently, that'll look like isolated components nested rectangles, essentially, that don't know anything about each other, theoretically. So, an automatic view library manages your UI based on the, the way the data changes and user actions. It handles loops, provides if statements, and provides a means of abstraction to manage complexity. That's an automatic view library. Some examples, uh, Ember and Angular contain an uh, a, an automatic view library, but they're bigger. They're, they're frameworks. Uh, they provide other things. React, Vue, and Raya are, are automatic view libraries. At TableXI, we use Vue or React. So why do we use Vue? Uh, it works with any build. Doesn't matter if you've got a script tag with a CDN uh, the asset pipeline, Grunt, Gulp, Broccoli, Webpack, uh, Browserify, did I miss any? I, don't, I, I can't remember what, uh, what I'm supposed to be using now. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of anti-tool these days. I just I kind of want to ship websites that make users happy. Uh, it's, it's faster than React. The Vue.js website has a detailed break, breakdown of why that is. Uh, and it's been vetted by the React community. So it's not controversial. It's considerably faster than React by default. There's less to learn than React because Vue speaks HTML. So whatever you're currently using to build your templates, you can keep using that. Uh, it doesn't matter, like Liquid, Haml, ERB. Vue don't care because Vue just needs HTML. You don't need to write JSX. Um, you could also use JSX if you want to. Uh, it, Vue also uses isolated components, just like React, with an optional Flux plugin. And uh, Vue allows you to use inline templates, which means you can start your user interface in Rails. Oh, a little closer. Oh, 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 a little louder. Thank you. All right, which means you can start your user interface in Rails and then sprinkle a little bit of Vue inside of it in a structured way, unlike jQuery, right? But it allows you to operate in the same space as jQuery. This is different from, from React, which works a little bit better with, uh, with isolated components, right? So why do we use React, then, if we use Vue? Uh, engineers friggin' love React. Like, you mention it, and they just go crazy, right? It's like, it's like uh, getting out a treat for your cat. Like, ooh, React. Uh, you can build native apps using React. That's typically what we use React for at TableXI. And it might win. It's, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to sell Vue to a manager because they've heard of React and they haven't heard of Vue. And there's other choices out there. If you're building a single page app, first of all, don't. But if you are building a single page app, just use Ember. It's, it's beautifully designed. Um, if I were building single page apps, um, heck, I'd consider using Ember just, or consider building single page apps just to use Ember. It's great. Uh, Angular 1's gone. Angular 2 is a different framework, and it's also based around single page apps. And Backbone isn't even uh, a view library, much less an, an automatic view library. Uh, Backbone doesn't actually do anything. It's like an event delegation library. It's, like, Backbone is more of a feeling than it is software. It's a feeling in your heart. So once again, my JavaScript rules. Don't use JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> Keep using jQuery plugins when it makes sense, and include an automatic view library in your projects by default, because when a designer comes to you with a novel UI, you should be able to implement that. So part two is going to be a series of short videos where I implement a very small novel UI. There's going to be no hidden code. Every action that I needed to take to build this, you're going to watch me take that. So the exercise here, we're going to start with a static address form, just like you'd see in an e-commerce site, like ship my stuff to this place, right? This address form has a country drop-down select with three options. The territory drop-down uh, has over a hundred options. I think they're called federal subjects in Russia. It, I, I, I ended up spending two hours in, Wiki, in Wikipedia last night looking up stuff on Russian governments because I needed to, because I realized, oh, wait, I'm not sure if these things apply. So, I'm not sure if that was time well spent, but it was fun. Ultimately, when a user selects a country, they shouldn't have to scroll past a hundred different territories to get to their territory, right? This is, this is really basic stuff. So it should be simple, right? It's so simple we don't even hesitate to do it. We just knock it out. So we're going to see the starting point. So you're going to see every single keystroke that I took to get here. 
It's okay if you don't remember everything I do. The important thing, the important thing to take away is how little code I needed to write to do this. So our starting point. So we select the country, and you notice how far we had to scroll to get to our territory. And right now, I'm just showing you how that form is rendered. It's just using ERB from a Rails G scaffold. Really, really easy stuff, right? The, the, the basic things in any Rails project. So step one is we're going to include Vue. And we're using Vue here instead of React because we want to mostly use Rails because it allows us to move quickly but use a minimal amount of JavaScript just to get the stuff done. So we're going to pop over to the Vue website, right click on download, and just save it into the vendor folder and check it into Git. That's it. Right? We don't need to gem install anything. We don't need Bower. We don't need NPM. For something this size, you know, you know, if you're feeling fancy, you can use curl. Right now we're going to add this to our application.js. I wasn't kidding when I said you were going to see every keystroke. Pop over to the console, capital V view, and it's loaded. It's right there. Right? So we have view. Now we're going to boot our view app. So we're going to create a file called main.js. We're going to wrap our code inside of an immediately evaluated function. So that way, nothing leaks gleek, globally. Also known as gleeks. What? Uh, I just threw a console log in there to make sure that the file is loading correctly. Now, inside of our document ready handler, we're just creating a new view app instance. And it's a little easier if you just have one view app per page. Uh, so I handed the body tag. So everything in the page belongs to that one view app. So now that we have view downloaded and booted, we're going to make a view component. The syntax for this is really simple, just view.component. You hand it a string. You hand it a, uh, an option object. Then in your markup, you use the name of that component as a custom HTML tag. In this case, we're doing an inline component because we want Rails to handle most of the stuff because most of it makes sense in Rails. And you see in the view dev tools, which Google for view dev tools is a thing, we've got our root app, and now we've got that form component. So now that we have our inline component in the page, we need to get some data from Rails. There's a few ways to do this. You can make an AJAX request. Uh, you can use a data attribute. Or you can use the GAN gem. I like the GAN gem because that means I have to type fewer things and think about fewer things. So we're going to pop over to, to the controller. The syntax for that is, is GAN.countries equals our country array. Save. And now we see gone.countries in the JavaScript console, and there's that array. Now we're going to grab the territories from the controller, and now the territories are available in JavaScript. Right? You see every single step we're taking. So we have our component. We've got our Rails data inside of JavaScript. Now we're going to put the Rails data inside of our component. So we're going to add a new key. Oh, this is a note to myself. <laughs> One file per component. I'm keeping it, in the, keeping it in the same file just so there's fewer things to look at. So we add a data key to our component options. And that returns our, our view model object. And I'm just saying foo bar, just so you can see on the, uh, in the view dev tools, it updates to reflect that. And now, we hand the array of countries to our component. That, sh that is sh in the background. You can see that in the view de dev tools. And our territories, we've handed that to our component. So we have all, so that's it. You saw all of the steps. You, you put 
the data, you give the data to Gon in your controller, and then you pull the data out of Gon in, in your component. That's it. So remember, our goal here is to filter the available territories based on what country the user has selected. So we need to bind that country dropdown to data. So we're adding a country key to our data, just setting it to an empty string, and we're just we're going to spit it to the out to the to the uh, DOM just for debugging purposes. So we're going to add an attribute to that select dropdown, and I'm just going to add a junk one at first just to show you there's no you know nothing up my sleeve. I just add foo bar to that select dropdown, and you can see foo bar has been added to that element. Now we're going to replace foobar with v model, and when view sees a v model inside of one of its components, it knows you want two-way binding, and we set that to the country key in our data. So now, whenever the user changes that select dropdown, the data updates. What's more is if the data updates, the select dropdown will change as well, and that's two-way binding. It's dangerous, but it's powerful. It's great because it solves real-world problems and allows us to move very quickly. All right, step seven, right? We have our data. We're now updating one of our data keys based on user actions. Now we need to have a list of territories based on the selected country. So. We pop back over to our component, and we add a computed property. Computed properties are from, it's stolen from the Ember community because they're awesome. It allows you to uh, very cheaply uh, 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 compute more um, information based on less state. And we're using the square bracket notation here. Just like in Ruby, right? Just like a Ruby hash. So this dot country is has been bound to the select dropdown. So if that's found inside of our option, then you'll get that array of territories, otherwise, or empty array. And that's so nothing else blows up. So it's always returning the same type, right? Pretty basic stuff. So we have, we've got our component, we've got data from Rails, we've got our selected country bound to the country dropdown, we've got our list of, country, our list of territories you know, in, you know, from our computed property. Now we actually need to render those, uh, those territories. So we're going to delete the Rails rendered options, and we're going to render those options with view. And the syntax for that is v-4. And once again, don't worry too much about the specific syntax. Just remember how little typing this is. And now we select a country, and we only see territories for that country. Select a different country, and that updates. They, we know the user no longer have to, has to scroll past 100 territories they don't care about. Now we're just filling out the rest of that form just to show, once again, nothing hidden, nothing up our sleeves. This is just a form. Rails knows how to handle forms. It still works, right? We didn't have to make a single AJAX request. Right? We didn't have to do anything really crazy to make the user's experience a little bit better, right? Simple things should be easy. And it, it took me far longer to explain what was going on than for me to type out what was going on. This was two minutes of typing. There's no step down. That's it. That's all. You saw every single keystroke it took to build that. So once again, here are my JavaScript rules, right? Don't use JavaScript. Use widgets if you can. And if the widget doesn't cut it, if, if you're building some, something novel, something that's not off the shelf, just include an automatic view library in all of your projects, so that way simple things are easy and hard things are possible. That's it. That's my talk. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.
Uh, we have time for only one question. Question? One. Thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I have a question about the JavaScript languages, the language that compiles into JavaScript. Are you using some like TypeScript or Dart? And if no, why? Sure. So the question is, uh, how do I feel about compiled languages? I love them. Like, I, I love CoffeeScript. I love ClojureScript. Uh, I'm going to learn Elm at some point. They, they seem great. Uh, however, day to day, I tend to just use uncompiled ES5, also known as JavaScript, right? because that's the one that runs in the browser. Because there's a one to one, it, there's a one to one relationship. Because I don't, in, because I enjoy the the languages, but I don't enjoy the tooling that comes along with them. Uh, it, there's always some kind of corner case. So you, even if it's working well in in development, maybe. When you push it to CI, suddenly you have to figure out a different thing. It, it adds another moving part. So in, until the tooling becomes a little bit better, I just stick to you know to JavaScript because, as you can see, like, like it it works just fine. Thank you, Zach.